everyone, Doug and Julie here with our 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E electric vehicle. And in this video, we want to share our adventures from our first long distance road trip. We're going to cover over 1600 miles of road in Oregon and Northern California. So you might want to grab a drink or a snack because this could be a long one. EV detractors love to tell you how you can't take a long road trip in an EV, how you'll never find a charger or how it'll take you hours to charge or how you'll just run out of charge completely. They'll also tell you that the crippling stress of range anxiety will ruin what should be a relaxing vacation. Well, we're here to tell you that that's all baloney. At the end of June 2022, Julie and I completed a six-day road trip from our home in Beaverton, Oregon, to Central Oregon, to Northern California, and back home again. All without any drama at all. Well, without any major drama. To be fair, we live in an area of the country that is very EV-friendly, with plenty of options for fast charging. If you live in, say, the middle of the U.S., you may have a harder time with a similar long trip, but it is still possible. The key to a good EV road trip is planning ahead. As the infrastructure grows, this will become less and less necessary. But for now, pre-planning is a must. Let's start with where we were going. Julie and I had been wanting to get away for quite a while, our last vacation being travel to visit family over the holidays. Despite living in Oregon for just shy of 10 years, there is still much we haven't seen, especially east of the Cascades. So our first stop would be a couple of nights in Bend, Oregon, where we're going to spend a little time in downtown Bend, but it was also an ideal spot to stay while we took a day trip further into central Oregon to visit the Painted Hills, considered one of the seven wonders of Oregon. From Bend, we would head to Northern California to visit family. My brother and his wife live in Copperopolis, while our aunt lives in nearby Sonora. We would spend a couple of days with them before heading home. Now the Maki -E has a very good navigation system, and we could just plug in each destination and set off on our way letting the Mach-E tell us where to stop for charging. But as this was our first road trip, and some of the roads we would be driving on were completely new to us, we felt it prudent to do a bit of pre-planning. We started with an app called A Better Route Planner. With this app, you can input info about your car, then your starting location and finishing location, and the app will give you recommendations on the route and where you'll want to charge. We set up an account, which allows us to put more information so the app will adjust to our specific requirements. For instance, we don't want to arrive anywhere below 15% state of charge and we want to leave at each station when we reach 80% state of charge. Why 80% you ask? Well, all EVs fast charge at a variable rate, i.e. they charge faster at a low state of charge, but slow down as the battery reaches full. This is done to protect the batteries. Most EVs have a significant drop off right at 80%. Our Mach-E drops to almost level two charging rates, which is painfully slow for road tripping. So at that point, it's best to just unplug and move on to the next station. The next app that we found important is the Electrify America app. Our Mach-E can charge at any DC fast charging station, but Ford has a partnership with Electrify America that allows our Mach-E to have plug-in charge. With plug-in charge, we can pull up to any EA station and just plug in, and the car should start charging without needing to swipe a credit card or open an app first. Because of this, we wanted to prioritize the EA stations over any others, and this app tells us where they are, how many are at each location, and if they're available or currently being used. A third app that is helpful is called PlugShare. Essentially, this app tells you where every charging station is located. A very good app, but for us it's more of a backup, only needed in case the charge stations selected by a better route planner have any problems. So we had our plans, we had our apps. What could go wrong? Well, as luck would have it, just before starting our trip, we got a notice of a recall for basically all Mach-E's due to potential overheating of the high voltage battery connectors that could leave us found on the road dead. But while it was a very real concern, we weren't going to skip our trip for something that has only been happening to a very few cars. We started our road trip on a beautiful Wednesday morning. We mostly charged the day before, but topped up our battery to 100% while we packed the car. All our luggage easily fit in the back hatch. We put snacks and drinks behind our seats. And we finally found a use for our frunk. The drive for day one wasn't a long one, but we were heading over a mountain pass, much of which we were unfamiliar with, so we weren't sure how that would affect the car's range. Taking a look at a better route planner, it showed us only traveling just over 170 miles. With an EPA range of 300 miles, we should make this easily, yet ABRP had us stopping once in Madras for a short charge. Hmm. We live in a western suburb of Portland, Oregon, so driving east, we first had to drive through the city. But it wasn't long before we were out of the city and passing boring Oregon. Yep, that's a real place. From there, the drive is just beautiful as we made our way up Mount Hood, where we would make our first stop.
This is Timberline Lodge, somewhat famous for appearing in the 1980 movie The Shining. Locally, it's a popular spot for skiing and snowboarding as the 6,000 foot elevation means the snow sticks around well into early summer. We weren't here to ski, but we were here for the snow. Julie and I had an idea for a holiday card photo and we needed a wintry background. We probably looked a little silly in our red and green sweatshirts, but we think we got the shot. Why is the carpet all wet, Todd? I don't know, Margo. <laughs> From Timberline to Bend, the roads were all new to us, but the weather was perfect and the traffic was pretty light, so we just took our time and enjoyed the miles and miles of amazing scenery. As we approached Madras, we still had plenty of range to make it all the way to Bend, but we thought we'd stop and check out the fast chargers anyway. They were charge point charge stations with a max output of 62.5 kilowatts. There were no EVs there charging. Probably a good thing as only two of the four stations were working. From Madras, it wasn't long before we were in Bend. We stayed in a hotel downtown, just east of the Deschutes River. The hotel didn't have any EV chargers, but there was an Electrify America station at a Walmart just a few miles away. But we still had plenty of charge in the Mach-E, so we spent some time exploring the area a bit. Our first stop was a blast from the past. No, your eyes do not deceive you. This is an actual, fully operational Blockbuster video store. In fact, it's the last one in the world. And it's right here in Bend, Oregon. If you're into movies or just want to see a good documentary, check out The Last Blockbuster on your favorite streaming service. It's a good watch. For us, it was a fun throwback and brought back memories of happy days browsing a video store. We're thrilled to see it still around and hope it continues for years to come. We obviously don't have a need for video rental on this day, but we bought some merch to support this now small business. Our next stop was Pilot Butte, just on the east side of the city. Most days you can drive up to the top, but the road up was under construction, so we had to hike. It's only about a mile, but obviously it has significant incline. However, once at the top, the views are amazing, and you can see much of the Cascades, including Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, Three Sisters, Mount Bachelor, and so much more. We capped our day with a little food cart dinner and called it a night. For our second day, our only plan was to drive out to the John Day Fossil Beds in Central Oregon and see the Painted Hills. We never charged up the car the night before, so the first stop in the morning was the Electrify America charging station at the local Walmart. Despite being a weekday morning, when we arrived there was only one more car charging, so we just pulled up and plugged right in. Fun fact, even though we had owned the car for over six months, this was the first time I had actually plugged into a fast charger. But plug and charge worked great, and the whole experience was a nice one. Processing payment. Payment authorized. So plug in charge has worked. Yay! Initiating charging. Thirty-six percent. Interesting says eighty-three percent is the goal. Mm -hmm. Forty-three cents per kilowatt hour, pre-tax. Ramping up. Way to go, 9502s. We had a nice chat with a Volkswagen ID.4 owner for a bit, then helped a woman figure out how to fast charge her Kia Soul EV. It was her first time too. We arrived with 36% battery, and after 35 minutes we crossed 81% on our car, so we unplugged and got on our way. Total cost would have been $18.92, but we still had some of our free 250 kilowatt hours from Ford, so this charge cost us nothing. 
The trip out to the Painted Hills was a little under 90 miles. The first part of the drive was through fairly flat agricultural land. But once we got past Prineville, we entered the Ochoco National Forest and the views were just spectacular. As we got closer to the Painted Hills, the terrain changed and we dropped quite a bit in elevation. From 26, the road to get to the Painted Hills is easy to miss. It's an unexceptional little road that seems like it goes to nowhere. It even runs out of pavement as you get to the site. But once we made our way in, we could immediately tell this site was indeed very exceptional. The Painted Hills has a total of five trails. We visited four of the five as we didn't feel like climbing the Carroll Rim Trail. The others were easy to drive to and each trail was a fairly short walk to and from the parking lots. The only downside was the roads were all gravel and our mach -E was quickly covered in dust. Aesthetics aside, the bumpy roads and high heat were no problem for the mach -E. It was the perfect carriage to get us around the site as we spent the better part of two and a half hours enjoying the unique beauty. In Prineville, we found a car wash and gave the Maki a much deserved bath. Back in Bend, we decided to charge up again before heading back to the hotel. Knowing the charge would take a little time, we stopped to get takeout. Charge stations don't always have the best food options, so once again, a little planning ahead makes this part of the EV experience a little better. We went back to the same EA charging station at the local Walmart, but this time the experience was not as good. Our first option for charging had one broken plug, and the sister plug just didn't work. So we backed out of that spot and pulled into the next one over. A bit of an awkward process with these tight, angled parking spots. But once turned around, we got plugged in and got charging right away. We started with 32% state of charge, and 27 minutes later, after we enjoyed our dinner, we were at 80% charge and ready to go. This charge session would have cost us $19.35, but once again, we had some kilowatt hours from Ford, so this one was free. We spent the rest of the evening walking along the Deschutes River and got a taste of what makes Bend such a fun city to live in. The plan for our third day was a fairly long drive. We were going to travel from Bend to Copperopolis, California, 520 miles in total. 
A look at a better route planner had us stopping three times in Klamath Falls, Oregon, Dunsmuir, California, and finally in Willis, California. This trip would have us arriving in copper with 15% state of charge, but we wanted to arrive with a little more charge in our battery, so we left our options open as we headed out on a chilly morning. Our first stint had us heading south toward the picturesque Mount Shasta. The mountain would be in many of our views, but mostly we saw forest and green. Just beautiful. miles later we arrived in Klamath Falls, Oregon for our first charge stop. The charge stations were in the middle of town, a little ways off the highway. Also, these were not Electrify America stations, but charge point stations put in by Pacific Power. Unfortunately, they only charged to a maximum of 62.5 kilowatts, less than half of the peak our Mach-E can handle. This meant our stop would take a little longer if we wanted to go to 80% on our battery, probably why ABRP had us only stopping here for 17 minutes. Basically, it wanted us to get just enough charge to make the next station but we were not racing to California and we're fine taking our time. Good thing because this would end up being a ridiculously long stop. It started as soon as I tried to get a charge started. Long story short, I couldn't get the app to work after trying several times and even trying to call ChargePoint to get help, only to be told to download the app in order to charge. Great. In the end, I just pulled out a credit card and paid like any gas station. That worked perfectly and we were soon charging. Knowing we were gonna be there a while, Julie and I had planned to have breakfast while charging. Julie had a leftover salad from the night before, but I needed to find something for myself. We found a coffee shop called The Daily Bagel, and I grabbed a couple of croissants. Back at the car, we enjoyed our breakfast in the comfortable morning air while the car charged away. After 47 minutes of charging, we had gone from 32 to 80%, but the cheaper charge rate meant we only spent $11.70 to get there. Since we had charged higher than ABRP suggested, we readjusted our next planned stop and targeted Anderson, California, 150 miles away. By mileage, this would be an easy target, but once again, we were uncertain how the elevation changes might affect our range, so we went a bit conservative. It turned out we would make it with ease, but that allowed us to relax and enjoy the scenic drive around Mount Shasta. Our stop in Anderson, California was fairly straightforward, but we had a strange situation pop up. When we arrived, the station was empty and we pulled right up, plugged in, and began to charge. As we were doing that, we noticed a woman had pulled up in her Hyundai Kona to charge. Thinking nothing of it, we headed into the Safeway for a restroom break and some Starbucks for Julie. While in line, I double-checked the Ford app to see where we were on the charging, only to find a charging fault message. It turns out the woman with the Kona couldn't figure out the charging, even after trying every charger, including the other plug from ours. That, of course, caused ours to stop charging. Fortunately, I just had to unplug and plug back in and we were charging again. She was on the phone with Electrify America, otherwise I would have been happy to help her. Clearly frustrated with her experience, she did finally get a charge station to work, but left her car parked precariously sticking out of the charging spot. Not good. The rest of the charging went fine, although we did notice the car's battery fans were running on full as our ambient temperatures were close to 100 degrees. But after 21 minutes of charging, we had gone from 41% to the magic 80% on the battery, so we unplugged and headed out. This session would have cost us $15.48, but once again, we still had some kilowatt hours left over from Ford, so it cost us nothing. Julie's driving now. <laughs> we're in trouble. We're in trouble. 
For the next leg of the trip, we were confident we could make it through Sacramento, so we planned to stop at an EA station in Stockton, about 200 miles away. And once again, by mileage, this should be easy, and we were familiar with this portion of the trip and knew it would be fairly flat. But the speeds in this section were significantly higher, and there was a bit of wind, so we would keep a close eye on our range and be ready to stop early if we felt uncomfortable. This is where apps like the EA app or PlugShare are a big help. Speaking of big help, the adaptive cruise control was a huge help in this section, especially through Sacramento, and made the drive very easy despite the traffic. Arriving at the Stockton EA station, it turned out we pushed our range further than we had all trip, down to 14% state of charge. It might sound a little scary, but that still left us with an estimated 42 miles of range. And as many charging stations as there are around the Sacramento area, we could have easily found another option within 42 miles. More worrying for us was the ambient temperatures were over 100 degrees, and highway driving would have made our batteries pretty warm. Do you remember the overheating concerns we mentioned at the start of this video? We did. So instead of charging to 80% like usual, we stopped at 55%, leaving us with an estimated 161 miles of range. As our destination was about 50 miles away, we felt this was plenty. So after 21 minutes of charging, we were on our way. This would have cost us $16.34, but you guessed it, this one was free. Back on our way, it was a relatively short drive to our destination. For the next couple of days, we would stay with my brother Greg and his wife Tana, who also own EVs. Here the Mach-E would get some rest and a recharge with energy supplied by the California sun. The rest of the weekend was time spent with family. Mach-E was put to limited use, with positive reviews overall. On Sunday, four of us took a little day trip courtesy of Greg's Tesla Model 3. With temps in Copperopolis peaking over 100 degrees, we wanted to beat the heat, so we headed up the mountain to the Bear Valley area for a hike around Lake Alpine. Once again, the views on the drive were beautiful. We arrived at a much cooler Lake Alpine and enjoyed an easy hike, along with some sightseeing before heading back down to Copperopolis. Back in Copperopolis, we stopped at the picturesque town center for some dinner and drinks before relaxing the rest of the night.
it was time to head home. Our last and longest leg of the trip, it was also the only part we had done before in a gas car, so we could make a direct comparison to traveling in our EV. According to Google Maps, if we didn't make any stops, we could make this 670 mile trip in about 10 and a half hours. Obviously, we're not driving over 10 hours without stopping. In fact, our limit is about two to three hours of driving before we feel the need to stop for a break. Most of the times we've made this trip, it took us between 11 and 12 hours, depending if we stopped for lunch or ate on the go. A quick look at a better route planner suggests we'll need four stops for charging, making the trip just under 13 hours long. However, ABRP has us leaving with an 80% state of charge, but we charged up to 95% the day before, so we thought we might be able to eliminate one of the charge stops. We targeted Anderson, California as our first stop, 233 miles away, the same station we stopped at on the way down. Double checking the apps, we had plenty of options to stop earlier if our math didn't work out. But it was still going to be a long day, so we were up and heading out by 6 a.m. The first stint would take us through Lodi, Stockton, and Sacramento, but surprisingly there was very little traffic, at least not like what we're used to. But once clear of the Sacramento airport, it was looking pretty good for our first stint making it to Anderson. To make sure, we kept our speeds within a few miles an hour of the limit. Sure enough, we pulled into the Anderson station with 13% battery and 34 miles of range indicated on the gasometer. A new record low for us. And what was awaiting us at the station when we arrived? Another rapid red Mach-E. We pulled right up and plugged in to begin charging. Plug and charge worked perfectly again. After a quick conversation with the other Mach-E owners, we noticed a third red Mach-E parked just down the way. And then the station got very busy. First with a Nissan Leaf joining us, then a Rivian R1T. It was after the Rivian pulled up that we realized we had pulled into a 350 kilowatt charger, which is considered bad etiquette since our car peaks at 150 kilowatts. We should be charging up at a 150 kilowatt charger, leaving the faster 350s for faster charging vehicles. Oops. But after 41 minutes of charging, we were at 80% and it was time to move on. Our free kilowatt hours from Ford had run out, so this session cost us $27.09. From here on home, we were back on the schedule as suggested by ABRP. So the next stop was Wairika, California. It was only 109 miles away, but gained significant elevation climbing Mount Shasta, so our efficiency would take a hit. Still, we had no problems with range and arrived at another Walmart charge station with 41% state of charge. I first pulled into another 350 kilowatt charger, but remembered our previous stop and moved to a 150 kilowatt charger. Funny enough, the same Rivian pulled in right behind us. It turns out they were headed to Seattle and making the same stops we were. There was also a Chevy Volt charging, which meant this station was now full. Once again, plug and charge worked great, so we headed into Walmart for a restroom break and walked around the store a bit while we waited. After 23 minutes of charging, we were at 80% again, so we unplugged and moved on. Our cost would have been $15.48, but for some reason our session was free. Thanks, Wairika. Our next and final stop was Sutherland, Oregon, another 159 miles away. We pulled into the Sutherland station with 32% state of charge. Lo and behold, it's not a Walmart, but a Dairy Queen. We pulled up to another 350 kilowatt charger, but there were two other open chargers, so we didn't bother moving. FYI, in many stations, it's hard to read the charge speed until you've pulled into the spot. And with these angled spots, it's not always easy to simply pull out and back into another spot. Once again, our plug-in charge worked perfectly, and to no surprise, our friends in the Rivian pulled in shortly after we did. Despite stopping by a Dairy Queen, we did not have any ice cream. 
Weirdly, this time of the day, it was just too hot for ice cream, if that's really a thing. The Mach-E was certainly feeling the heat anyway. But after 27 minutes of charging, we were back to 80%, so it was time to go. This session cost us $19.78. From Sutherland to home was another 168 miles. We started picking up a bit of traffic from about Eugene on. Nothing terrible, but another time we were very thankful for the excellent adaptive cruise control. On a trip this long, it's just not worth trying to rush, and we tend to adopt a more patient mentality. It's not only better for our efficiency, but also for our stress level. The car would make it the rest of the way no problem, but we anticipated more traffic through Portland, so we ended up making one more restroom stop just a little north of Salem. At the end of our trip, we pulled into our driveway with 25% battery, exactly 12 hours and 8 minutes after leaving Copperopolis. We plugged in to top off our charge while we unpacked and reflected on our first EV road trip. Overall, we were very happy with our experiences, even with the very few minor hiccups. The Mach-E makes a great road trip car as it's very smooth and comfortable. We used Blue Cruise a few times, but found the intelligent adaptive cruise control was all that we needed to reduce a lot of the stresses of travel. I'm happy to say we never had to wait for a charger, but there were a couple of times where they filled up completely while we were there, including one time where another car had arrived and had to wait a few minutes for a charger to open up. Had this been a holiday weekend, our story might be a little different. For sure, the infrastructure needs to grow. A lot of EV detractors bemoan the long charging stops, but we found them to be no big deal. You can optimize your stops in such a way to spend as little time as possible at each station, only charging enough to get to the next stop but we didn't mind the few extra minutes to charge to the magic 80%. That just meant we had plenty of time to get out and walk around a bit, which made each subsequent stint in the car easier and more comfortable. So let's look at some numbers. Our total mileage was 1,623 miles. We made eight fast charging stops for a total of 242 minutes, making the average stop right around 30 minutes. We added 312 kilowatt hours of electricity, which because we still had free kilowatt hours from Ford, only cost us $58.57. If we had to pay for all of our energy, it would have cost us $144.14. For comparison, if we had made the same trip in our Subaru, at $5.50 a gallon and 30 miles per gallon, gas would have cost us just under $298. Had we made the trip in our Boxster, at $6 a gallon for premium and 20 miles per gallon, gas would have cost us just under $490. I had intended to keep track of our efficiency, our miles per kilowatt hour, but to be honest, we forgot to reset the trip odometer a couple of times, so we kind of abandoned that idea. With all the varying speeds and elevation changes, our efficiency was all over the board, so it would have been pretty fruitless anyway. But it should be noted that we had zero range anxiety. None. Probably because we had planned and planned and then planned ahead some more, but also because we had all the apps and navigation tools to help us if we ran into any problems. And while this was our first long road trip, we'd made a few day trips in the Mach-E, and we'd already done a couple of fast charging sessions. And really, after fast charging once or twice and realizing how easy it is, any of that stress just goes away. This was a wonderful trip. And our Maki -E just made it that much better. Don't let the detractors sway you. You can take a road trip in an EV. We can't wait to do it again. Like,
camera may be moving in the same motion with your head. <laughs>